We're looking at page 694 in the Old Testament. It's the book of Isaiah, and we're starting at chapter 8 and verse 19. And as I read, marvel at these wonderful words written 700 years before Christ. Isaiah 8, verse 19, page 694. The darkness turns to light. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If everyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upwards will curse their king and their God. Then they will look towards the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. And they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And God's people said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. We lift up our brother David now as he comes to speak to us. We thank you for him. We thank you for the time that he's had in preparation in this old ancient prophecy and pray that by the power of the Spirit we would hear it in such a way that we would transform those words into our heart, that we would put them into action in our lives today. Lord God, would you prepare our hearts to hear from you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, David. Well, uh, do please keep your Bibles open there, page 694. And thank you very much, Dave, for your welcome and invitation to join you this morning. It's always a joy to come to Cranley and to see old friends and make new friends. So thank you very much for uh, your welcome. One of the most important principles to live by is that our actions produce consequences. We may have freedom to choose, but we are not free from the consequences of our choices. Uh, and then we have to choose how we respond to those consequences and the consequences of the consequences. So we all make our choices, but in the end, our choices make us. 
You see that right in the beginning when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God's instruction and to take the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The consequence was that they lost Eden, that the whole human race ever since has been fallen, and that we have always had this sense of um, alienation from God. You see it today in the political scene. Uh, the budget which Liz Truss's uh, government produced had consequences, pretty devastating ones. But you see it also on the micro scale in our families, bringing up our children. Uh, very important lesson that our children have to learn is that actions have consequences. And of course, as we try to do a good job as parents or grandparents, we're conscious that we often get it wrong. As a friend of mine used to say, we brought up our children by trial and error. We made the errors and they provided the trials. <laughs> but uh, it was like that for King Ahaz and for this situation in uh, Judah, where the people of Judah were being forced to recognize during the prophecy of Isaiah that we've just read, that actions produce consequences. And those wonderful familiar words of promise of the child to be born remind us that we are in the season of Advent on our way to Christmas. Commercially, we may have been there since early October, but spiritually, we're making the progress towards the great celebration of Christmas. Now, prophecies arise from a particular context and the more we understand why it was said and what it meant to those first hearers in Isaiah's day, the better we shall understand its meaning and its benefits to us today. And whenever you're reading the Old Testament, it's a little bit like going for a walk in the hill country. You know, if you go out for a day in the hills, you uh, maybe have a look ahead of you and perhaps let's say you see three hills lined up one behind the other and they look reasonably close together and you work out well maybe if we got to the first one by mid-morning we'd be able to have our lunch break on the second one but then as you make the journey you find that there's often a long way down and a long climb up which you didn't really take account for if you're like me anyway and uh, the hill peaks are more distant from one another than you would think they are well, on a walk in the hills, it's geographical distance, but in scripture, it's time. And I want us to think of the three peaks. You see, when a message comes through the Old Testament, the first hilltop is the immediate hearers, them, then. Then you travel forward in time, in this case, 700 years. And the prophecy on the second hilltop finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that isn't the end of the story. For 2,000 years later, here we are celebrating his birth and looking forward to the third hilltop, which is the eternal kingdom of God, the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, where the complete fulfillment in Christ's second coming will see his everlasting kingdom of righteousness and peace. So whenever you're in the Old Testament, think, what did it mean to them then, hilltop one? What difference does that make? to the fact now that Jesus has come, Hilltop 2. And what have we got yet to look forward to on Hilltop 3? Now, in our passage this morning, which I hope you've got out open in front of you, there are just two sections, chapter 18, 19 to 22, and then 9, 1 to 7. So we've only got two points this morning. And the first is God's prescription for the darkness. God's prescription for for the darkness, and that's chapter 8, 19 to 22. Now, as we've been reminded, all this happened 700 years before Jesus was born. It's actually the year 734. We know that because of what was happening in Israel at that time. King Ahaz had turned his back on God. He was beset by his enemies. They were threatening his throne and his very existence. And though he was given the opportunity to trust God, he rejected God's promises. He was a real unbeliever. He decided to trust in his own policies. The big threat was the superpower of the day, Assyria, which today is Iraq, sweeping down from the north, swallowing all those little kingdoms of the Middle East like Syria and Israel and Edom and Moab. But Ahaz had a plan. 
he formed an alliance with the Assyrians. He thought, if I can get on the side of the big boys, they'll protect me. But it meant he had to send the silver and gold from the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem as a gift to the emperor of Assyria. It meant that he took on board Assyrian gods and even produced an altar to worship them in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Oh yes, all the religious worship of Judah went on. The priests still presented the sacrifices to the Lord. But alongside it, there was this syncretistic worship of other gods. Pagan practices began to infiltrate the whole community. And we read in the book of Kings, if you want to hear this, read the story, it's 2 Kings 16, that Ahaz even offered his own son as a sacrifice to the Assyrian idols. That's why in verse 22, Isaiah says, look to the earth and all you see is distress and darkness and fearful gloom. Because Ahaz's actions had consequences, economic consequences, because the, the nation of Judah was taxed by the Assyrians in such a ruinous way that Ahaz had to empty his whole treasury and strip the temple of all its gold and silver to raise enough money to satisfy the emperor. And then he had to squeeze his own citizens to the maximum because he kept on demanding taxes from them. All because Ahaz rejected God's promise and went for his own policies. Social and moral decay set in as God's law was sidelined and rejected. Oh yes, the religious rituals went on, but the priests and the prophets were more concerned about their own livings and their own fees and their own security. Darkness and fearful gloom. Well, you don't need me to draw any parallels to the modern world, do you? Uh, in a world that has largely, in many places anyway, rejected God, and especially in our own country, turned our back on the inheritance, the heritage that God has given us. We know what it's like for people to experience darkness. As we meet with friends and neighbors and colleagues during the week, that's what people are experiencing, isn't it? There are so many challenges on so many fronts. What's going to happen? Well, verse 19 shows us what the people of the darkness were doing. They're actually multiplying the darkness by resorting to fortune tellers and uh, seances and spiritual spiritist mediums because they wanted to know the future. What's going to happen? If you think back to when COVID first hit us and the consequences of that, the sort of questions we ask. How long is it going on for? Is there no way out of this? What's going to happen? Are we going to be shut down? How long? You see, if you reject God, you have only human resources to turn to. And the devil is delighted to use those human resources like the spiritists and the mediums or anything else that seems to offer answers by which to ensnare the vulnerable and the unwary in his web of deception. But God has a prescription for the darkness. So as we live in the darkness in the 21st century, it's different from then, but it's the same human mechanism that's at work. What is God's prescription? Look with me at verse 20. Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone doesn't speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Well, the instruction is the Torah, the law in the Old Testament, how to live in accordance with God's character. And the testimony is the prophetic messages that Isaiah was bringing to his people in his day. And what he says is, God has spoken. The dead can't help the living. Only the living God can do that. So verse 20 provides the crucial test, doesn't it? Are you going to consult God's instruction? Are you going to be led by his word? Because what Isaiah is saying is that the only light in the darkness is in the word of God. It is God's self-revelation that shines the light into the darkness of our human inadequacy and ignorance. And if we reject that, what are the consequences? Look at the end of verse 20. They have no light 
of dawn, no hope of the darkness lifting, no future to look forward to. Instead, in very vivid terms, verse 21 pictures distress, the word really means fear, hunger, displacement, roaming, anger, rage, cursing directed at God, the God of the covenant and directed at the king. People always blame the government, don't they? And they still refuse to trust. The answers are all there in God's word. We have the 66 books of the Bible, a lamp for our feet and a light for our path, but men love darkness rather than light. Actions have consequences. So the question is, is humanity then sunk in this perpetual darkness? Well, chapter 9, verse 1 begins with a great word, nevertheless, nevertheless. There will be no more gloom for those who were in darkness and distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. So here is God's intervention. And after his prescription for the darkness, which is hold on to the word of God, center on the testimony, Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord, I will put my trust in him. God then proclaims the light into the darkness. Now the location of verse 1 is significant. Zebulun and Naphtali were the northern tribes. They were the first uh, of the Jewish people to fall to the Assyrian invaders. And Matthew, in chapter 4 of his gospel, introducing the Lord Jesus, stresses that his ministry began where? In Galilee. In Galilee of the Gentiles, as it was called, because it was the great crossroads, east, west, north, south, the trade routes, and people of all sorts of nations and all sorts of background came through Galilee. The deeper the darkness, the more wonderful God's transforming light. So God is going to do something. He's he's making an announcement that he has determined to dispel the darkness. And that's why that great verse 2 is there. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, we know that this prophecy refers to Jesus Christ because when we get to verses 6 and 7, it talks about someone who is not just merely human, but divine and human. So if Jesus didn't come till 700 years later, why is the prophecy written in the past tense as though it's happened? They've seen a great light. The light has dawned. Well, it's a device that's used by the prophets to show that for God, who is outside of time, what he is promising is all settled. It's done and dusted. It's 100% definitely going to happen. And they use the past tense because it's just as though it has happened in God's eternal plan. He is going to break into human darkness with a great light. It's going to be transforming in a total sense. Just as when the world began, God said, let there be light, and there was light. So he's going to shine that light. And because he's committed to it, you can put it in the past tense. It's just as though it happened. Now, look at what the consequences of that divine action will be. In verse 3, joy. In verse 4, freedom. In verse 5, peace. Joy, both for harvesters and warriors, because they're celebrating gifts from God. The gift of harvest, the gift of plunder after a battle. They are celebrating what we would call today non-contributory benefits. That's what God's light brings. Joy, as he loads us with his blessings. Freedom, verse 4, from the heavy burdens imposed by the oppressors. Midian's defeat is a reference back to the victory that God achieved uh, using Gideon's 300 men back in the book of Judges against the whole Midianite army. And this freedom is an amazing gift of God. He's going to take away the yoke of oppression from Assyria, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor, 
beating these people on the back, making them his servants. Freedom and peace. Verse 5, the military uniforms are consigned to the incinerator. There's no need for them. No more war. In the great light of God in this kingdom that he's bringing. Joy, freedom, peace. Are they not exactly the blessings that the whole world is longing for today? Not just happiness, but joy. Freedom, peace. And only an action of God has that consequence. Only an action that God can bring about can make that happen. So what will he do? Verse 6, for to us a child is born, has been born, past tense again. To us a son is given. In other words, the great light that is going to shine into the darkness of humanity is a child, an ordinary human baby, but born to be a universal and eternal king. So he will be much more than merely human. Ahaz has already been told the name of the child in chapter 7, Emmanuel, with us God. God is going to come. Now in Hebrew, the names always reveal the nature. They're not just labels. They're statements of identity. So if you look with me at verse 6b, the second half of the verse, you'll see that it says, and he will be called. That is, this is who he is. These names are not just chosen randomly. These are the expression of who he is. Four pairs of names or titles, and each one has two parts. And here is the amazing prophecy that God gives to Isaiah all those centuries before Jesus was born. Because each of the pairs is one human and the other divine in its reference. Let me show you what I mean. The divine action is the virgin birth of the Emmanuel child, God with us. And the consequences are spelt out in the names. Wonderful is a divine word. It's used 54 times in the Old Testament of the actions of God. It's supernatural, out of the ordinary, miraculous. The only explanation for something wonderful is that this is God. That's how the word's used in the Bible. So that's a divine word. Wonderful counselor. Counselor is a human word. A teacher, a guide, an instructor. He is going to be the divine instructor the supernatural counsellor. You go to the second pair, mighty is a human word. Mighty men, courageous, powerful warriors, strong heroes in the Old Testament. Mighty is human, but look at this mighty one. He is, secondly, God. So there you have the human word, mighty, and the divine word, God. The third pair, everlasting, is a divine word. Only God is everlasting. He's eternal. He's the one who's unchanged and unchanging. But father is a human word. At its best, it speaks about a concern for our children, caring for them, seeking their well-being, doing everything we can to facilitate their own uh, fulfillment in life. Divine, everlasting, father, human. Prince is a human word, a man with great authority, a ruler. But peace is the divine word, shalom. And that is something in Hebrew which only God can bring. Salvation, rescue, a broad open space of freedom. Only God can produce it. And the nature of the light is this child who is to be born, who is therefore both fully human and fully divine. These are the characteristics of the Messiah. And when later, 30 plus years later, he stood in the temple and this child grown to manhood said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There is the second peak. There is the fulfillment. No wonder the night sky over Bethlehem was lit with the glory of the Lord when he was born. And no wonder John says, the light shines in the darkness 
and the darkness has not put it out. But as we end, the climax of the whole unit, the whole prophesying is in verse 7. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Justice, righteousness, that's what the world longs for. It was precisely what David's throne was not producing under Ahaz with his godless uh, resistance to the Lord and his purposes. But the king whose kingdom will be boundless and everlasting is the one through whom everything is changed. The human condition is transformed. He will establish it, that he did in his first coming. He will uphold it, that's what he's been doing ever since he ascended back to heaven. And it will never end. And it will be a kingdom of fulfillment, justice, righteousness, peace, joy, freedom. All these blessings that come through the Christ child. And if you find yourself saying, can that really be true? Well, know that that last sentence of verse 7 is the answer. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal is the passionate ardor and commitment of God to do what he's promised. He is the great I am, the Lord, who's always the same and always keeps his promises. And he's the almighty one. So he will see this through. He will accomplish it. And he did that night in Bethlehem when the baby was born. And he did through the 33 years of his ministry. And he did through the succeeding centuries ever since. Because in Jesus Christ, God has broken into our world in light and life to bring liberty and joy and peace. So here is the challenge and blessing of Advent. Why would you walk in the futility of human darkness when the light of God has dawned? in our Lord Jesus Christ. When God offers you and me freedom, joy, peace, membership of a kingdom that will never end, eternal life on that third peak, in his presence forever and ever. Why ever would you settle for bumbling around in the darkness and fearful gloom of human inadequacy and human failure and human sin when God is offering you membership of the kingdom of heaven well as they say these days it's a no brainer when you look at it like that isn't it so let's as we approach Advent seek to share this good news with as many folks as we can but let ourselves be the channels of this light and truth come to Jesus day by day when you need his instruction seek him as your mighty as your wonderful counsellor when you need his power in your life Know him as your mighty God. When you want resources to care for others and support them, come to him, the everlasting father, for him to give you his strength. And when you seem overwhelmed by all the problems of life, as so often we can be, know that he's the prince of shalom, peace, salvation, fullness in Christ himself. What a terrific message to proclaim there will be no more gloom for the people walking in darkness have seen a great light and what we need to do is to make that light our own through faith in him let's pray just a moment or two of quietness as we reflect on what we've seen in God's word and let's turn perhaps one thing that the Lord said to us this morning into a prayer in the quietness and then I'll just lead us briefly. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not put it out. This was the light that lighteth every man that was coming into the world. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we've seen his glory.
glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Lord Jesus, open our eyes to see more of your glory. Open our hearts to receive more of your love. And strengthen our wills that we may be channels of love and joy and peace to others. And ask, we ask that your great name may be honoured and that this Christmas season many may come out of the darkness into your marvellous light. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.